Everybody and welcome to News Now, this Monday edition, the last day of September. Man, this month just flew on by. We are live in Dallas, Texas, where the closing arguments for the Amber Geiger case are being made. This is the former police officer who says that she went into the wrong apartment and shot and killed Botham John. She took to the stand on Friday and started crying. She said she didn't mean it. And she said she felt like she couldn't live a normal life anymore. And uh, so we shall wait and see what happens here. We've been following it for quite some time. Uh, I'm currently joined by Ron Hoon. Ron, thanks for being here. Yeah, there was a story uh, just this past week. Uh, I, there's just so much drama with this trial, and I think a lot of people have tuned into it just because of the unbelievable set of circumstances. Uh, but there was an instance uh, that where, um, without realizing that the victim's family members, I believe his parents, were in the courtroom one day, the judge actually apologized after discussing, I guess what you could say were some very specific details regarding the crime scene uh, and the family actually had to get up and leave the courtroom and the judge then apologized and said that uh, basically in a nutshell just didn't realize that the family was there uh, in the courtroom at the time. So a heartbreaking story of a young man whose whole life was in front of him and who never had a chance to defend himself. Has the defense done enough to create enough shadow of a doubt in the minds of the jury that uh, potentially she could be saved a guilty verdict we'll find out Ron surprisingly this trial continued over the weekend on Saturday mm. they had um, officials testifying as to what they found in the case during the investigation and so this is day seven of the trial and it's been more than a year it was September 6 last year that Amber Geiger says she mistakenly walked in a Botham John's apartment thinking it was her own she got mm -hmm. scared thought mm -hmm. he was an intruder and so the testimony from the weekend was a Texas Ranger and lead investigator, David Armstrong, who explained how a high stress situation might affect an officer's judgment. But I know from listening to the testimony, yes. uh, one of the main things that has been asked is she had CPR training. She was an officer. Okay. So why didn't she try to save his life after she realized what had happened? Mm. Boy, that is a good point, Paul. That's a really good point. Yeah, I mean, she. We've seen some of the uh, some of the officers' body cam video because it became obviously evidence uh, in this particular court case where she just primarily just seems to be freaking out. Yeah. Uh, and so I. Yeah, that's a very good point. Why didn't immediately upon realizing what had happened? Yeah. Why didn't she do something along those lines? I don't know. A lot of questions. This will probably be a court case that is, uh, you know, once it's over and done with, that will be talked about for years. And if, in fact, there is a, a finding of guilt, uh, you know, there will be obviously the potential for appeals, et cetera. But just the whole set of circumstances, really yeah. unbelievable. A report from our sister station, Fox 4 in Dallas, is saying that it was also pointed out during the trial that Geiger was trained on non-lethal ways for dealing with a possible burglar, mm -hmm. like retreating and using her police radio to call for help. Right. So there's yeah. so many different facets of this case, and uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens, um, what, you know, what sentence, what guilty uh, comes down at all. Yes. And, uh, and yeah. then you've got the sentencing phase as well. And you know, the interesting part about it is you just never know when it goes before a jury. Sometimes you think to yourself, oh, it's an open and shut case. They'll be back the very same day. Mm -hmm. And yet other times, I mean, all it takes is one dissenting voice in that jury room yeah. or a couple. Uh, and you've got the potential where deliberations could drag on for days and days and days. We're about to find out. <laughs> All right, Ron. So uh, the I word, we're still talking about it, even though Congress is in recess, right? Yes. <laughs> Let's take a live look at the Capitol, by the way. I love being able to pull up all these different live feeds. Yeah, I know. Especially <laughs> on a rainy, rainy day yeah. in Washington, D.C. I've been back there a few times. I don't think, well, except for when I was a kid. I do actually remember Pilar. Okay, I'm pulling this one out of the memory banks for sure. First <laughs> time I ever went to Washington, we, uh, as a family, I think I was like about eh, maybe 11 or 12 years old. Yeah. And I couldn't believe the rainstorm. It was a summertime rainstorm in July. And I re just remember being in the streets and just being soaked and trying to find something, you know, <laughs> running for cover. I mean, they can get some massive 
rains there, particularly even in the summer months, kind of like we do. Yeah. And the rain was pouring today. Uh, Pilar is going to be showing you the full, uh, unedited remarks of the president's speech this morning from the White House. That's all coming up. But you're right. I mean. Uh, we have a lot of different angles to talk about today. I mean, the president raised the specter of treason aimed at uh, Adam Schiff. Yeah. You know, so here he is, a, a major uh, member of Congress uh, who runs the uh, who runs the House committee that is involved in all of this, uh, and this is based on. Frankly, I think if he had to do it all over again, Adam Schiff would not, when the whole country was tuning in, would not have gone through that whole made-up conversation. Right. I think he now probably realizes that was a mistake. But the president is not letting go of that, uh, saying that uh, he feels like the way Schiff is handling everything amounts to some serious wrongdoing. He actually raised the specter of treason, uh, which I think maybe opened a few people's eyeballs. Uh, that's for sure. I mean, we are in a very politically charged environment there uh, in Washington. But the bottom line is this. Is there a deadline or is there not? Uh, you had uh, one member of Congress who was giving an interview this weekend who said there is no deadline. But you had others who, was, who said we are aiming for Thanksgiving. Uh, but again, I, when, the, when it's this important, and you're talking about removing a duly elected president of the United States, which, by the way, has never happened in our nation's history. Yes, we've had presidents impeached, right? but they've never actually been convicted in the Senate. Bill Clinton wasn't convicted. You all the way back to Andrew Johnson in the days after the Civil War and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He got impeached, but not convicted in the Senate. It's never happened. So if you have a very fast time frame, I don't know if that plays particularly well in the general public and in the voting public, because it almost makes it look like you've decided ahead of time, uh, we're going to kind of race to the finish line no matter what facts actually come out in this investigation. Yeah, and Ron, when we hear that the whistleblower could go in front of Congress soon, mm -hmm. it makes you wonder, it's probably still going to be behind closed doors, right? right. And it's only going to be with think. certain members. You would think. Yeah, uh, members of some of these either, basically the way this is going to work, Pilar, there are really only two committees on the House side and two committees on the Senate side that matter. Yeah. And they're high profile, and they're the intelligence committees, and they're the justice uh, committees. So, uh, I mean, these will be crucial hearings in this day and age when it is very difficult to hold any secrets in Washington. It does seem like eventually this whistleblower's identity is going to come out, but I should point out his lawyers actually wrote a letter, his or hers, we still don't know that part of it yet, right. uh, wrote a letter and sent it to uh, several key members saying, uh, we're seriously now concerned for this person's safety. Not quite sure where they're going with it, what that, what that means exactly, but they are saying in no way, shape, or form should this person's identity be released. Uh, it was, I believe, the New York Times, could have been the Washington Post, uh, actually had reported that the person is a CIA officer, so we know we know that far. And I'm sure it's not just a circle of two or three people <laughs> in Washington who know the identity of this person. The president tweeted over the weekend, he said, I have a right to meet my accuser. Yeah. Um, will that happen? Who knows? Probably <laughs> not. Just to recap, we've been following this extensively, but for those who may not yep. have been tuned in, yep. The anonymous whistleblower alleges the commander in chief was withholding foreign aid to Ukraine at the same time he was asking their president to investigate former Vice President Joe Biden, as well as Biden's son Hunter, who was on the board of a Ukrainian gas company. So it's all about 2020 now, mm -hmm. what's going to happen. You know, Democrats are ramping up their campaigns. Here's a live look at the White House there. You can see some of that rainfall you were talking about on the lens. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, there, there's some brand new polling that's coming out that shows a majority of Americans, 55 to 45 percent, this is a YouGov CBS poll that shows a majority do favor the idea of at least investigating. Right. Now, when it comes to actually convicting and removing from office, well, that's a whole different ball of wax. But in terms of really opening it up and digging into it, 55 percent of Americans say, yeah, I favor the idea of moving forward with this. 45% do not. It's a, such a split between Republicans and Democrats, though, Pilar. I believe the number is 23% of Republicans who favor it, 
uh, 87% of Democrats wow. who favor it. So that's a huge chunk of the number, basically, uh, of folks who are observing who are Democrats. And I actually found the part of the poll where they talked about independence is maybe the most interesting part of all. 51% of independents say they are not in favor of this. That number sort of surprised me. Yeah. I thought independents might be leaning for, yeah, more, let's open it up and let's take a good hard look. Let's face it. Demo the vast majority of Democrats know who they're voting for. The vast majority of Republicans know who they're voting for. Independents really, I do think, have the potential to decide this election. How will this process unfold and how will it play with independents? That could have a major impact on who wins in 2020. Yeah. Ron, you remember on Friday we had a Harris County Sheriff's Office and Texas deputy killed on the job? Yes. And it was just, it was absolutely sad, and we got to see part of a procession yes. uh, from the hospital to the medical examiner's yeah. office. Well, now there's new video out of New York today. Uh, they're mourning one of their own. Take a look at this. I, this is always so sad, but when you see the majestic, the beautiful video like this honoring mm -hmm. the lives of our first responders lost, whether it's mm -hmm. a police officer, whether it's a firefighter. Yeah. So NYPD mourning the loss of an officer this morning, police and first responders paying their respects in Rockland County as a procession drove the body of officer Brian Mulkin to a funeral home. Mulkeen, excuse me, was killed after being struck by multiple bullets early yesterday morning during a struggle with a suspect in the Edenwald section of the Bronx. Mulkeen served nearly seven years with the NYPD mm. and lived with his girlfriend, who was also an NYPD police officer. The suspect, 27-year-old Antonio Williams, was shot and killed by police. Investigators say Williams was on probation until 2022 for a narcotics-related arrest. Mm. I just feel like we're seeing this too often. Oh, we are. It just makes you wonder, what has changed in the last, uh, I don't know, 10 years or so that so many of our officers are put in harm's way and fall victim uh, to this kind of violence. It is a brotherhood and a sisterhood that never ends. Yeah. And you're talking about not just NYPD and NYFD, but all over the country, yeah. every police department uh, and every fire department, because they're out there every single day putting their lives on the line. Yeah, you want to talk about how tight-knit of a community law enforcement is and first responders. They yeah. hear about these incidents mm -hmm. across the country like pretty much immediately mm -hmm. because of how close they all are with yeah, each other. And yeah. in, in the uh, Texas incident from last week, they were saying that he was pretty much attacked from behind, that he had no idea. Oh, yeah. yeah. And we've had incidents over the last few years uh, where literally an officer might be ambushed just sitting in his or her patrol car. Yeah. You know, filling out paperwork not even seeing the, uh, you know, the killer approach. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. It's, and you hear all the time, routine traffic stop, during a traffic stop, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. Just doing their job, yeah. not expecting, just going in. And that's why you hear those tips all the time. Like, hey, when you're pulled over, mm -hmm. have your windows down, have yeah. the lights on, right. put your hands on the steering put wheel. Put your hands on the steering wheel. And yeah. it's unfortunate that we have to spread messages like that in order mm -hmm. to tell people, like, hey. Correct. Meanwhile, Ron, does it feel like fall to you yet? Uh, well, as a matter of fact, yes, we'll be one on the air at 4.30 this morning. Pilar at the Fox Television Studios, right in the heart of downtown Phoenix. <laughs> we were 69 degrees. We always say we're sort of in the uh, the middle of the urban heat island, uh, you know, right downtown. So it seems like no matter where else you're talking about, the temps are a little bit cooler. That means most folks in the metro area woke up with temps in the mid-60s I this know. Morning. <laughs> and uh, we don't even think we're going to hit into the 90s for at least another three or four days. I know, it's currently 78, at least according to fox10phoenix.com. Wow. And this morning it was crisp. When I walked out, I was like, I should have brought a jacket. Oh, is that incredible? <laughs> Speaking yeah. of, here is the 10-day FoxCast. Uh, yeah, so no more hundreds. I think we're done. Triple digits, I fingers crossed. So. I <laughs> hope so. I mean, it's not unusual to see one or two of them pop up in October, but nothing even looks close right now. Yeah. All right. Uh, more news now is just moments away. Ron, thanks for joining me. You bet, Pilar.